Well, what we've seen so far is that uh, work and how it's being organized has been studied for 80, 90 years. And uh, organizations tend to pulsate between a centralized state where decisions are made uh, in the middle and then channeled out and a decentralized state where you give your local branches or the local workers more authority to make decisions. And what seems to happen is that organizations pulsate between these two states and they lose some slack in the transition between the two. So I see that continuing into the future. But there are certain trends with regard to work and workflow that might affect us in the longer term. So one of the things that I see happening is that more and more mobile devices come into play. We see that the sale of laptop computers exceeds desktop computers, that you got your palms and your Blackberries, your smaller devices that can be used to deliver work to wherever you currently are. So the setup of work is going to change from the traditional office environment to areas that you perform work wherever you are with a network connection with such a device. And one of the challenges that we're facing in that context is how to identify the right person for the job. So we'll need to give a lot of thought to mapping work and tasks to qualifications. And then it doesn't matter anymore whether you're in the same office space or whether you're sitting in China or in Bangalore or in the Czech Republic. You can distribute work anywhere. The world really has become flat in terms of workflow. So for 25 to 50 years out, that's a long period of time. But I picked up a book recently, it was called Office Work and Automation, and it described how information can really change the work uh, in the office and how the office performs. And that book was written in 1956. So even 50 years ago, people thought about how can office work benefit from technology and how can it be automated. I think that's a trend that's going to continue. But we have more sophisticated technologies these days. Um, I think a lot of the things that we were dreaming about 30, 40 years ago are now technologically possible. So now it's up to us what we do with these opportunities from a management perspective. There certainly is rejection of tasks that limit your um, ability to make decisions. You, know? um, you don't want to have spoon-fed work uh, where a system makes the decisions, you fill out this form, you sign this, this work order off, and that's about it. So there's a certain trend toward job enlargement and casework, that you give somebody responsibility from the beginning to end for a particular task. Um, so yes, I do see criticism of the Tayloristic workforce. At the same time, we need to think in Tayloristic terms in order to chop up work that we can ship overseas, that we can ship to wherever work needs to be executed. But we need to chop it up at a higher level of abstraction. And that's a task that lots of people that grew up with workflow software in the 80s and 90s are now faced with, that human work is much more complex and much more flexible than the systems that we have built to support human work. We will have the separation between the specialists, the functional specialists, and the generalists, um, and then the people that manage both of them. So I think functional specialists will become deeper and narrower in their exper expertise and you, people will market themselves with their skills. So you can get a personal assistant today from Bangalore um, for a fraction of the cost that it would be to hire somebody in New York. Um, a functional specialist like that is, um, is a hot commodity and I think that's going to have an impact on our education system. So we will see more and more niche educational programs um, that move from the traditional broad-based MBA to more functional specialties such as outsourcing in the financial industry. So people are going to improve their skills that gives them an edge over the competition in the marketplace. At the same time, you need generalists who can bring together these functional specialists in an organizational setting. So this interface function is going to increase in importance. And you will see more interface specialists that take care of work being moved from one place to another and in a global landscape. That's something that we don't have at the moment and that's direly needed, in particular when we, when we think about moving processes abroad. I see the 
standards as one of the most important things. We are beginning to see a rise in standardized technology, plug and play technology that allows us to use different components uh, that have been developed in different settings by different companies and use them together in a common business process. I see data standardization. Companies finally agree on what an invoice looks like, what an order looks like, what uh, um, a travel expense reimbursement request looks like. So because we standardize data, we can standardize our applications and then we can distribute work through that. There are certain skills that are going to become obsolete or that are going to be misplaced. And there are other skills that will be in high demand. So there's a transformation going on in the workforce and that puts certain stresses on society. So a natural tendency is to shield yourself off against this change and to just say, um, I'm not going to allow the outsourcing of work, I'm going to tax companies that are going to do that. Um, but on the other side, I, I don't think there's a way around this trend. And even today we're seeing that certain parts of India are becoming too expensive um, as, as work centers. So who is the, or where is the country that India is going to outsource work to? An HR division has to make sure that you have the right talent at the right place and that you offer people a development path from where they currently are to where they fit in in the new workforce. So that means that you have to identify those jobs that you may not have 5, 10, 15 years out and you have to offer people that are in these jobs at the moment a certain transition. So send them to courses, offer them specialized training skills, uh, training courses to yeah to fit in to the new world well one of the things if you distribute work if you're no longer bound to a central location um, one of the questions that you're facing is how do you immerse people in this work experience how do you make them part of an organization even if they're not physically present and I think um, visuals play a great role with that the visual part of our brain is much older than anything that has to do with text with reading um, so the role of Canon as a company that deals with imagery, or with pictures, is a great role in this, in this future work world. So if you think about the small devices, having a video phone at your disposal is, um, is great, but somebody needs to put the content in there, somebody needs to put the video in there. And I see the same thing happening on the desktop. Um, we still have need for paper signatures on documents, um, and you will need to digitize these documents and send them around the world. So there's a, definitely a place for Canon to play the content feeder role in, in this new work world. I would say companies have a social responsibility at this stage of transition from a centralized office-bound workforce to a more decentralized mobile workforce. And harvesting the skills of your employees is both um, and on, the, on the one side a function of matching the right person to the right job, but also to develop people into the capabilities that they can have and should have in the future. So the social responsibility of the company then is in giving people a clear path how they can move into the future, into the new work world, and in showing them ways how to get there. That includes things such as education, but it also includes things such as just being frank about which types of work have a place at which location? Which parts of work are you going to move somewhere else? Am I going to have the same job 25 years from now? Probably not. I mean, I see it in education. We're changing our delivery methods massively. I can see iPods, I can see podcasts and streaming videos of lectures uh, coming up in the next two, three years. Then you will have education on demand and you will be able to pick and choose the program that will increase your skills in the particular discipline that you need. So it's, we're really moving into an on-demand world, on-demand skills, on-demand work. Because it's so easy to move work around these days, um, it's important for a company to give people some routing in their local environment and at the same time give them the feeling to belong to a corporate unity. So that's where the role of corporate culture comes in. So, so we're faced with a situation where people may be locally rooted in a community and globally rooted in a workforce. They work together with colleagues that have the same interest or the same professional background. And we have something that's called 
um, a public privacy these days that people are putting more and more information about themselves online, make that available, um, but they can control about how much information they share. And we find that people tend to be closer to somebody on the other side of the world that has the same interest than to their next door neighbor. Um, so that's a trend that companies also need to deal with, that you may not like the people that you work with in the same office, but there's a colleague somewhere in France or in Great Britain that you collaborate with splendidly. So it's the role of a manager, of a global manager, to find out who are these people in a global team that work well together and that can perform to the benefit of the company and to the benefit of the team.